explosion. I believe we're having an earthquake. I have never before seen such horrific weather. I advise you to take cover immediately. The books of Bible prophecy have long been shrouded in mystery. Ancient texts, cryptic numbers, symbolic imagery, all depicting awesome apocalyptic events soon to come. Is it really possible to understand what they mean? What is the mark of the beast? Is it, as some say, a computer chip implanted under the skin, or even something more insidious? And what about the Antichrist? Has this sinister enemy of God already made his appearance? Or is he still waiting in the shadows? Will some terrorist event trigger Earth's final tribulation? Will we witness the horrors of Armageddon and the seven last plagues? What do we need to know to avoid being left behind when the Lord returns? Will we recognize the last days and know what to expect? The books of Daniel and Revelation are full of numbers, figures, images, signs. Many Christians are silent about it. But is silence the solution? What do the numbers and figures such as 666 stand for? What is the mark of the beast? What is the role of the United Nations and America in prophecy? Are these prophecies still relevant to our age and time? Find answers to these questions and more in an adventure in Bible prophecy at Victory Sanctuary Seventh-day Adventist Church by Oba Oyekon Estate, Lekki Phase 1, Lagos. Praise the Lord. I want to welcome us to you tonight. And I want to let you know that it's going to be good in the presence of God Almighty. Praise the Lord. We, this is the first one we're having this year, Adventure in Bible Prophecy. Adventure in Bible Prophecy. And it's very important for us to study Bible prophecy because how many of us know that it is the will of God for us to understand the Bible? Amen. If God does not want us to understand the Bible, he wouldn't have written it to us. It's the will and the purpose of God for his children to understand the Bible. You know, and I feel that God, who started, I mean, not only understand the Bible, he has put some prophecies in the Bible. And it is the will of God also for us to understand biblical prophecies. Amen? Because, I mean, how would you like to write a letter to your son or to your daughter or to your children and you don't you wrote it in such a way that they will not understand it who writes a letter to his to his children and then you don't want them to understand the letter so that when they are reading it they just they get confused that's not if we human beings would not do that how much more 
our Heavenly Father. It is the will and the purpose of God that our Heavenly Father wants us to understand prophecy. And the next two, three days, we're going to look at prophecies that are in the Word of God. Prophecies, I know we as human beings, we all love prophecies. If you will follow me tonight, at the beginning of every year, people want to listen to prophets who want to tell them, they said this year, they said some big musicians will die. People want to listen to that. They said uh, some actors, you know, people like to hear prophecy. Especially they want to hear the negative one. And then I know a particular prophet, he will say some big politician will die. And what happened? All the big politicians will be going to see him. Please pray so that it will not be me. Oh. They will be praying so that it will not be me. Oh. They, will go, they will go and be giving him money. Please pray for us. So do something for us so, so that it will not be us. You know. Thank God because our Father in heaven does not take money. Amen? Africans, not only, I mean, we, not only Africans, but all of our human beings generally want to know the future. They want to know what holds. Even people, when people are dying, they want to know what's going to happen to my family, what's going to happen to my children, what's going to happen to my household, what's going to happen to my business. People generally want to know the future. And I'm saying that the Bible opens a glimpse of the future to us. The Bible opens a glimpse of the future to us. And that's why prophecies are important. You know, people go everywhere. You know, there's only called crystal ball. If you heard about it, ball, crystal ball. You know, some people will go there and then the man will look at it and look at it for them and say, this will happen, this will happen, this will happen. And people are thrilled. Anywhere people go and there's supernatural prophecy, people, the line is always heavy. It's too many people will go there to go and listen. But here we have in the word of God prophecies that God has put together. It doesn't, it's not costing us anything. Only search, believe. Why are prophecies so important? Number one reason why prophecies are so important tonight is that it authenticates the word of God. Amen? What I mean by authenticating the word of God, I mean it lets us know that the Bible is true, that the Bible is real, that the Bible is, I mean, the word of God is so real, it's so powerful. You know, it, it tells us that the Bible is not just an ordinary book, but the word that God has spoken to us. The interesting thing about the Bible tonight is that the Bible was written in the period of how many years? Who knows? A span of about 3,000 years. No, 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 no. It's more than 3,000 years. So yeah, about, about three, 4,000 years. A span of that level by different authors, but they all agree. Amen. Different authors. Who lived at different times, but they all agree. And tonight, everyone is going to answer for us in Jesus' name. I... In the book of Matthew chapter 24, before Christ died, he, made the pro he referred to the prophecy of prophet Daniel. And he said to them, says, Matthew 24 verse 15, says, when therefore you see the abomination of desolation spoken by prophet Daniel in the holy place, then let us know that, then let them which are in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the house top not come down and take anything out of the house. Here Jesus was prophesying to them about how the destruction of Jerusalem will take place. He said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by army, then know that what prophet Daniel has said is about to come to pass. Praise the Lord. He said, when you see it in a place, know that what prophet Daniel has said is about to come to pass. So he told them, he says, listen. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by army, it says nobody should leave. Those of you that are outside, don't come back into Jerusalem. And those of you that are inside Jerusalem, run out. And we know that in AD 70, Jerusalem was surrounded by army. And um, for almost two, three years, they couldn't penetrate into Jerusalem. So the Jews believed that Jerusalem was such a powerful thing. But, so the, but the Christian knows that Jesus stood there when Jerusalem is surrounded by army. By army, that is the end of Jerusalem. Jerusalem will be destroyed. So Christians knew it. The disciples knew it. So what they did was, after about a year, after they had surrounded Jerusalem and they could not break into it, the disciples, suddenly the army 
retreated. They moved away and they left. When they left, the Jews began to celebrate. Ah, Jerusalem, nobody can destroy it. It's impregnable. Nobody can enter into it. So all the Jews outside Jerusalem ran into Jerusalem. All the ones that were inside stayed. They said, yes, God is here. You know, but all the Christians said, that's an opportunity. They remember the prophecy of Jesus. It says, wow, opportunity for us. So they ran out. Those Christians that were outside ran away. And a few months after, Jerusalem was surrounded again. And within space of weeks, they were able to enter Jerusalem and destroy it. And we are told in that destruction of Jerusalem, it was so bad that pregnant women were ripped open. They killed children, they killed adults. The temple was destroyed. Everything was destroyed as Jesus said it would be. But the good news was that no Christian died there. Amen. Because they believed the word of God. Tonight, ask your neighbor, say, are you a believer? Say, do you believe the word of God? In the next two, three days, we're going to be looking at the word of God. And I want to make sure that we believe it. Because if we don't believe it, I mean, if we don't know it, we'll never believe. But when we hear it and then we see it, we're going to see what God is going to do. I mean, I'm going to read one or two prophecies to us. Isaiah 13, verse 19 to 20. Isaiah 13, verse 19 to 20. It says, And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of child years, excellency as when God shall be as when God overthrows Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 20. Go to verse 20. And it shall never be inhabited. Neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there. Neither shall the shepherds make their food there anymore. I was says, Babylon will be destroyed and it will never be inhabited. Babylon will be destroyed and it will never be inhabited. Sometimes last year, I, was, I traveled to the Middle East. You know, I went to Greece. And I saw that, I saw a lot of Asian city that are still there today. Jerusalem, the Bible says Jerusalem will be destroyed, but it will also be inhabited back. And today Jerusalem is destroyed and inhabited back. But he said, listen, it says Babylon will be destroyed and it will never be inhabited anymore. The place where Babylon was today is bush. Wild animals are there. Nobody could ever rebuild it before because the word of God said it ever before it happened. I'm saying, I have, in the Bible, we have so many prophecies like that that tells us. We are going to look at prophecy for this last time. You know, it says, it says Babylon will never be inhabited again. People tried to rebuild Babylon, but they couldn't. But some city, it says, it says some of those cities will be rebuilt and they were rebuilt. The Bible is the word of God. Amen. The Bible is the word of God. The Bible is the word of God. So tonight the Bible help us, prophecy help us to authenticate that the Bible is true. Prophecy prepares us for what is coming in the future. You know, if we know what is coming in the future, the Bible says when you know the weather, when you, you know, something that is close to prophecy is what they call weather, weather prediction. In Africa, we don't, in Nigeria especially, we don't worry about weather too much here. Why? Because we know it's either, it's either rain or what? Or sun. If the rain is heavy, I will run under one house and keep myself. But when you travel abroad, where there is heavy snow, where there is where winter is strong, where the rain could be very windy, it could be very cold, people go out in the morning and say, before you go out, look at what does the weather say today? In fact, anytime I'm abroad, I want to know what does the weather say for the next three days? So I will know which day to go for shopping. Which day you won't go for shopping. Which day to stay at home. Because the weather, you see, when you know the future a little bit, it helps you. I want to say something to us tonight. If human beings can predict the weather, they can know the future, how much more is God Almighty? God that created the world, that created the weather, that created the future. He can tell us this is what is going to happen. This is what is going to happen. This is what is going to happen. You know, people want to know what's going to happen in the future. You know, it is, it is when, when, when we know what is going to happen, it helps us to be prepared. You know, anytime I'm in Canada, I know that when I know it's going to be cold, everybody will go and get cold things. You know, you're going to have to dress warm. You know, and that's what prophecy does to us. When you know the prophecy, you can prepare for what is happening. Like the Jews were prepared for the destruction. You know, there are some prophecies we are going to consider tonight that pertains to the last day. The last days which we are in. And when we understand that, 
It's going to help us to prepare for the future. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Okay, let's bow down our heads and seek the Lord in prayer. Holy Spirit, I cannot teach this, but I need you to teach it. So that your name can be glorified. So that your name can be exalted. So that your name can be praised. I ask Holy Spirit that you will teach us by yourself. Give us deep revelation tonight. And at the end of it all, let Jesus alone be glorified. Because we have prayed in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. One key way by which you can understand prophecy, if you go to 2 Peter, 2 Peter 1, 20, it says, the Bible says, no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. No prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. That means you can't just say, this is what I think. This is what I think. This is what I think. No. You see, we use the Bible to interpret the Bible. Amen? Anything you see, any symbol you see in the Bible, there's an answer for it. You use the Bible to interpret the Bible. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. That means that if you want to understand prophecy, you need to understand the scripture. The interestingly most symbols and terms in the book of Revelation can also be found in the Old Testament. Now, the book of Daniel and Revelation are very interesting book. Most people say, I don't read Revelation because I don't understand it. I don't read Daniel because I don't understand it. But the way God does not write a book and doesn't want you to understand it. In fact, although the book of Daniel was sealed to the latter days, because in the book of Daniel it says, seal it to the end time. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in the end times. Amen. And this book has been opened to us. We that are living in the end times. Amen. You see, in prophecy, you can use, you use the Bible to interpret the Bible. For example, Revelation 17, 15 says, what does, when you, what does sea or water represent in prophecy? It says, and he said unto me, the waters which thou sawest, which where the world sit are people, multitude, nations, and tongue. Revelation 17, 15. The water which thou sawest. It says they are what? People multitudes, nations, and what? And tongues. So when you see what time prophecy, what does it represent? People, multitude, nations, and what? And tongues. So when you see, when you see anything in prophecy that talks about water, it's talking about people, densely populated area. Amen. Let me take us one more. Beast, for example. What does a beast? There are different beasts that appears in prophecy. What does a beast represent, for example? In Daniel 7, 23, and it says, and it says, and the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all other kingdom, and shall devour the whole earth. So the fourth beast shall be what? The fourth what? Kingdom. So anytime you talk about beast in the in biblical prophecy, you are talking about what? Kingdom. I'm going to talk about that more tomorrow night. You know, because each kingdom, each country has is represented by a certain beast. For example, Nigerian is represented by what? Eagle. That's why you have green eagles. How many of us know green eagles? At least they, they, they won the match the other time. So, America is represented by eh? American eagle. Nigeria is what? Eh? Which one is us and the eagle? Anyway, I will give it to us tomorrow night. Amen? But the Bible says, well, anytime you see a beast, the eagle is the United States of America. A bear is Russia. The horse and the eagle is Nigerian symbol. The horse and the eagle put together is, in, is a symbol of Nigeria. What we do is that most countries, most nations have a symbol of an animal, of a beast that represents them. You know, so in biblical prophecy, when they talk about beasts, they are talking about kingdoms. So tonight, I just want us to study the prophecy of Daniel. In this whole place, we are going to look at the prophecy of Daniel and Revelation. That's what we are going to look at throughout this, this, this time. And I'm going to take us to Daniel chapter 1 and chapter 2. Tonight, our topic is United Nations in prophecy. What did I say? United Nations in what? In prophecy. United Nation in prophecy. Now, I want you to take note of this. 
Look of Daniel chapter 1. I first in Daniel chapter 1. Before I go to Daniel chapter 2, I want to give us a background to this story. The Bible says, King Nebuchadnezzar went to Jerusalem and he took, he destroyed Jerusalem, took the Jews captives, and he took some of the noble boys, some of, the, some of, the, some of them as slaves, and he brought them to, to Babylon. When he got to Babylon, he chose some of those boys that they felt were, were, were serial. They, I mean, that they felt they was, they felt, he felt that they were intelligent, they were sharp. He took them, out of them were Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He took them to the Babylonian court and said, train these people for me for three years. He put them in the university. He says, when they finish, they can work for me. You know, he wanted to use their brain. He changed their names. And then when you look at it, he, he, found that he said they should feed them food, do things for them. In Daniel chapter 1, we saw how Daniel says, wait a minute, we will not eat the king's delicacy because they are forbidden. Most of the food have been sacrificed to idols. Most of the meats are not good. So he said, we will not eat it. I said, they dedicated themselves. Daniel proposed in his heart that he will not defile himself. And he says, just give us water and what? And vegetables alone. And you see what happened. And the Bible says, in 10 days, the man was afraid. Ariok, who was taking care of them, was afraid. He says, hey, if you boys don't turn up very well, what's going to happen? So in 10 days, there was a difference between Daniel and the people. And then after their training session, in three years, after they finished training, Nebuchadnezzar tested them. He found that Daniel and his colleagues were far better, were ten times smarter and better than the people, the rest, who were doing the things. I want to say something to us tonight. The kingdom of God is superior. Amen. And God wants you to be ten times better than every other of your colleagues in the world. Amen. God wants your life to be ten times better. God wants your intelligence to be ten times better. So, Bible said, because of this situation, Daniel and his people were promoted. Amen? So they were promoted and they became one of the wise men. They began to rule over certain areas in the land of Babylon. Now, in Daniel chapter 2, that's where we are going. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, he dreamed. And the Bible says, the dream was so much that the dream left him. You know, that his spirit was troubled. So troubled that his sleep left him. When Nebuchadnezzar woke up, he said, oh my goodness, what sort of dream is this? So he, he called all the wise men of Babylon and told them, he says, listen. <coughs> he says, I have dreamed a dream and I cannot remember it. In Daniel 2, 4, they said, oh king, live forever. Tell us your dreams and, and, and we will inter give you the interpretation. He says, therefore, tell us your dream and then we will tell you the interpretation. Nebuchadnezzar says, I can't remember the dream, and I cannot remember the interpretation. If I tell you the dream, you will now give me a fake interpretation. So he said, hey, I'm not going to tell you, since you say you people are wise people, you say you are intelligent people, you say you are great people, he says, just therefore tell me the dream, then I'll believe that interpretation is. And then the wise man says, listen, next slide, there is no man on earth who can, who can do what you're asking for? What is this saying? Like Brother Essenet now, he dreamt in his house, Jejeli. He slept. And then he came to me the next day and said, I should tell him his dream and interpretation. You know, it's, it almost looks impossible. That's what the Kabbalist was asking for. He says, Pastor Ibuku dreamt at night. I don't know what he dreamt. And then he came in the morning and says, I dreamt, but I can't remember the dream. Please tell me the dream and the interpretation of the dream. Oh, my goodness. So the, 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 the people said to him, says, thank you. It says, there is no man on earth who can do what you ask. So, the king said, what am I going to do? The king said, look, if you don't tell me the dream and the interpretation, I'm going to kill all of you. Look at this, you people are fake. You are fake wise people. You are fake astrologers. You say you are medicine man. You are fake. Tell me the dream and the interpretation. If you don't tell me, I will kill all of you. So, they said, but we can't do it. It's only God that can do it. The said, okay, good. Go and execute them. As we are going to execute them, they took Daniel too and his people. So Daniel and his, went to the king and said, Oh king, why do you want to kill us? They said, I had the dream and I can't remember the dream or the interpretation. Daniel said, listen, there is a God in heaven. Give us some time. We'll go and seek our God. The God that we serve, he knows your dream and he knows the interpretation. Amen. What you are dreaming in your heart, God knows it. Amen. Tell your neighbor, say neighbor. 
Say, neighbor, God knows everything about you. Even what you are thinking right now. Whether it is good or bad, God knows your heart. Amen. What you don't know. So Daniel and his friend, they went and they began to pray. If you look at them, next slide, they went to pray. You know, and as they were praying, they went to seek God. And said, God, it's only you that could reveal such things. In Daniel 2.23, the Bible says, God gave that revelation to Daniel by night. Amen. I want to say something to you that God will reveal things to you if you ask him. Amen. Things that people don't know, God knows. I don't know. One of the reasons, one of the things the church has done is that we have not used the opportunity that we have. You can go to God and ask him for wisdom. You can go to God and ask him for direction. Hey, things that, you can go to God and ask him for things that will happen in the future. Things that has happened. God can show us many things. Amen. The Bible says, in, in two, it says, I thank you, O God, of my fathers, for you have given me wisdom and might. So Daniel went back to the king and said, O king, I, know, I have the dream and the interpretation. In Daniel 2, 20, he says, king, now listen, he says, king, it's not because I'm a good man. It's not because I'm a great man. It's not because I've done anything special. But there is a God in heaven. Somebody said there is a God in heaven. He said there is a God in heaven who reveals what? Secrets. I don't know what secret you have, but there's a God in heaven that knows the secret. Amen. See, so God can show you secrets that will take you to greater places. God can show you secrets that will change your life. That's why they say one word from God can change your destiny. Amen. So there's a God in heaven. And he has made known to the King Nebuchadnezzar what is going to happen in the latter days. Now let's quickly look at the dream and the interpretation quickly and then we'll close. Now, Daniel said, listen, he went to bed last night and he began to interpret it in Daniel 231. Oh king, you are watching and behold, you went to bed last night. You are worried what is going to happen after you are gone, after you died. After what is going to happen to your kingdom? You are worried. And so as you are worried, say so you went to bed. Now God gave you a revelation. Listen to me. Because I believe because God wants to promote Daniel and them. That's why the king had that dream. Somebody's going to have a dream because of you in Jesus' name. Oh, yes. Somebody will not be able to sleep because of you in the name of Jesus. So when God wants to excel you, he will bring things that people don't know anything about. And then God will give you the revelation and you are the one who will be able to do it. You know the king, Joseph, you remember that story? That in Genesis, King Pharaoh had a dream. Couldn't interpret it. Joseph interpreted it. You see, God will cause something to happen on your behalf in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is a great God. He says, listen, why you are looking at it? Say so you had a dream. Say so you saw an image in the dream. He says, that image is made of different metals. The head of gold, the breast of silver, the thighs of bronze, the legs of iron, and then you have partly mixed with clay. So that was, says, that was a long image. It says, as you are watching this image, it says, a hand without hand, a stone came, thrown by a hand through a stone. That image, it struck the image and crushed it together, and it became like a mighty shaft, and all the things were thrown off. The wind carried them away in Genesis, Daniel 2.35. So it was so that there was no trace of them found anymore. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole heart. Amen. Amen. So in Daniel 2.26, it says, Dan, it says, King, this is the dream. Now I will tell you the interpretation. Amen. If you are the king, the man was not there when you dreamt. Now he told you the dream. Would you believe him? Yeah. He wasn't there. You were dreaming gently in your room. And he was able to know the dream. And was able to tell you the interpretation. I want to tell you something tonight. That's why people are fascinated by the supernatural. You go somewhere. Somebody says, hey, brother, come. Your name is Anima uh, Shao. You say, this man has not known me. How can he know my name? You understand? So if he, after he has told you that, and then he now tells you, in your room, at the corner, there's something there. You say, ah. And you know there's something there. He now tells you, go and bring 10,000 naira. You quickly go and rush and bring it. <laughs> That's the spirit of divination. But we are saying, when after he has told the king the dream, he said, yes, I remember, that is the dream. And he said, I'm going to give the interpretation. Now, what is the interpretation? What happened is that God gave Nebuchadnezzar a revelation. So what is it? Revelation. Revelation of what will happen in the political scene of the world from the time, from his time to the end of this world. God gave Nebuchadnezzar a revelation of what is going to happen from the, from the time of Nebuchadnezzar in the political scene. I want you to take a note of the political scene. Now many people think that anything is just happening on earth. 
I have a good news for you. Not at all, anything cannot just happen on earth. God is in control of both political and spiritual element of this earth. Amen. Still without power, following the horrific tornado, three twisters have touched down just south of town. And now, a rolling motion. I believe we're having an earthquake. I have never before seen such horrific weather. I advise you to take cover immediately. The books of Bible prophecy have long been shrouded in mystery. Ancient texts, cryptic numbers, symbolic imagery, all depicting awesome apocalyptic events soon to come. Is it really possible to understand what they mean? What is the mark of the beast? Is it, as some say, a computer chip implanted under the skin, or even something more insidious? And what about the Antichrist? Has this sinister enemy of God already made his appearance? Or is he still waiting in the shadows? Will some terrorist event trigger Earth's final tribulation? Will we witness the horrors of Armageddon and the seven last plagues? What do we need to know to avoid being left behind when the Lord returns? Will we recognize the last days and know what to expect? The books of Daniel and Revelation are full of numbers, figures, images, signs. Many Christians are silent about it. But is silence the solution? What do the numbers and figures such as 666 stand for? What is the mark of the beast? What is the role of the United Nations and America in prophecy? Are these prophecies still relevant to our age and time? Find answers to these questions and more in an adventure in Bible prophecy at Victory Sanctuary Seventh-day Adventist Church by Oba Oyekon Estate, Leki Fizwon, Lagos. Pastor, there is no king that can come to power except by the power of God. And so tonight we are going to look at the dream. What is the interpretation of this dream? A metal. So now this is the interpretation. He says, the head is head of gold. Somebody say head of gold. Head of gold represents, he says, that's the head of gold. And he says, that head of gold represents the first kingdom that will rule. So you, O king, you are kings of kings. You are the head of gold. In Daniel 2, 37 and 38, that's what he said. And he says, that, that means the first kingdom was the Nebuchadnezzar kingdom, and that is the kingdom of what? Of Babylon. He says, the head of gold. Somebody say head of gold. So that me image as a head of gold, as a breast of silver, and then in the thigh of bronze, in the legs, iron, and then in the feet, iron and clay. So we want to know, what does the gold represent? It says the gold represents the first kingdom that ruled on earth. The first major kingdom. The first one world government. See, Nebuchadnezzar ruled and ruled the whole earth. It was the, it was, it had a number, it was the first kingdom that ruled on earth. Nebuchadnezzar ruled in Babylon. Babylon was so beautiful. Babylon, I mean, Babylon was, was such a beautiful place. I mean, have you heard about the seven wonders of the world? 
When you talk about the seven wonders of the world that ever happened, one of them is in Babylon. The hanging gardens of Babylon. The hanging gardens of Babylon. Have you, how can you have a garden in the air? They had it in Babylon. It's a wonder. How many of us like wonder? Wonder, wonder. You know, the seven wonders of the world. One of them is in Babylon. Babylon was such a beautiful city. It had the, hang, the hanging gardens of Babylon. Babylon city was such, was one of the largest cities that they had in the olden days. I mean, Babylon was 10 miles square, 16 kilometers round. It has a square miles of 16 kilometers. 16 kilometers this way. 16 kilometers this way. 16 kilometers this way. I mean, you know, now we have very big cities, but in those days, Rome was just 10 kilometers, but was six miles or 10 kilometers, but Babylon was, was 16 kilometers. And then in Babylon, it says, they call it, it says, that man, that's, that's, Head is head of gold. Somebody say head of gold. I want to take note of something. During the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, the most common metal was gold. The head of gold. And then they had what we call the temple of Madoc, which was 300 feet high. I mean, it was very high. Higher than most of the, most of the building that we have today here. You know, it was covered and glazed with gold, overlaid with gold. I mean, the, I mean it was beautiful. The altar of the throne was made it was a temple where they worship Madoc, which was the god of Babylon. But all of it was made of solid what? Gold. When you check Nebuchadnezzar, you find that it was, his whole rule was filled with gold. People had gold. It was the most common metal they were ruling. But the rule of Nebuchadnezzar did not last forever. Amen. You see, the rule does not last forever. Nebuchadnezzar wanted to rule forever, but God didn't allow it. Suddenly, after, by the time we got to the year 3... 31 BC, Nebuchadnezzar was removed. I mean, if you follow the story very well, this thing I'm saying to us tonight, most of the things we are saying in this, you can go to the internet or go to the encyclopedia and check them to be sure that that thing is true. He said, Daniel told him, he says, after you become another kingdom, which will be the chest, the arms of silver. Now, out of gold and silver, which one is more superior? If you are following me, wave your hand. It says, which one is more superior? Gold. The Bible says, after it comes the head, after the head of gold, it comes what? The arms of what? And chest of what? Of silver. And it says, another kingdom will come. And in history, it says, but after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, which is the meat and the pasture. Now, if you want to look at the story, you find that the next kingdom that came was the kingdom of the meat and the pasture. Uh, if you look at the story in the book of Daniel, study it. Belshazzar was king. Belshazzar was king. How did Belshazzar rule? Belshazzar was reigning. And then one day he went to take the corpse of, 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 of the God of Jerusalem, of the king of kings, the corpse that has been dedicated for God. Belshazzar had a party, called all his friends, and he took the corpse that, were take, that they took in the, in, the, in, the, in, in the temple in Jerusalem. He took that and he was decided to, they, he had to use it to serve wine. They were having parties. While they were having parties, a hand came on the wall, which says, take it, mene, mene, take care, which means, says, mene means God has numbered your kingdom and has finished it. God has numbered your kingdom as what? Has finished it. I want you to imagine, all of us having party here, where he says, suddenly a hand came and began to write something on the wall. He wrote mene, mene. And in fact, Belshazzar was afraid. A hand, they saw the hand. They saw, they didn't see the face. They only saw a hand. Writing something on the wall. And the answer is, Mene, Mene. Tekel means you have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Your king, Perez means your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Pasha. That night, he couldn't, he didn't understand it. So they had to get Daniel to come and interpret it. Daniel said to them, Look, hey, what God is saying that tonight you have been judged and your kingdom has been transferred to Medes and the Pasha. And the Bible says that night, the Medes and the Pasha, they came into, the, into Babylon that night. Before that time, everybody thought nobody can ever enter Babylon. What did they do? There, was a, there is a river that entered into Babylon. They diverted the river. Yeah. They diverted the river to another place. And then the soldiers came in through the waterways and entered Babylon and killed all those people. And thus says the Lord. But this has been prophesied in Isaiah 45 1. In Isaiah 45 verse 1, God mentioned the name of the person who would do it. His name is called Cyrus. He's there, Isaiah 45 1. He says, I have sent him before in me. To subdue nations, to lose things. You see, it says even the gates that has been shut that nobody can enter, Cyrus will open it. Cyrus was the one that led the army and he led the Mede and the Pasha into Babylon. And what happened? 
they got in, destroyed it, and that was the end of Babylonian reign. Amen. That was the end of what? Of Babylonian reign. A, a cylinder was found several years after, which is called the Cyrus Cylinder. You know, that cylinder talks about the date that Cyrus, I mean, Cyrus entered into Babylon. That means archaeology supported this story that what we are saying is true. So after the Medes and the Persia rule, they ruled for several years. But if something was very interesting when they were ruling, the most common metal was silver. The most common metal was what? Silver. The Medes and the Persia ruled for several years. They called them Medes and Persia. That was, that was the kingdom that Daniel was when they threw him into the lion's den. It was the Medes and the Persia that was ruling at that time. And he says, then, then he said to the king, he said, after the Medes and the Persia, after the arms of silver, the next one is what? Tie of what? Of bronze. You can see that. Which one is better, silver or bronze? Silver. Bronze is inferior. So another kingdom came that was inferior to that. And that was, that was in the, 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 the Greece started ruling. And in Daniel 8.21, it says, And the male goat is the kingdom of the Greece. The large one is between the eyes, is the first king. And in Daniel 2.39, it says, Another third kingdom of bronze shall arise, which shall rule over the earth. Now, I want you to understand that all this kingdom, when they were reigning, they reigned over all the earth. We had a one world government. They were, they were controlling all the countries of the world. You know, when the Babylon was there, it was controlling all the countries of the world. When the Medo Persia came, they were controlling all the countries of the world. And then we have the third king, which is Greece. They came and they began to control all the countries of the world. The most important, the, their number one king was called. Alexander the Great. How many of us have heard about Alexander the Great before? We studied history. The man is called Alexander the Great. He was young, just 30, just about 30, 31. He had conquered the whole world with speed. Tomorrow we are going to talk a little bit about him. Alexander rode. He conquered the whole world. The Greeks, they were, and their soldiers were wearing bronze. They were using bronze metal in their rule. I mean, they rule, they rule for several years. They were controlling until Alexander died, and then after some time, some little rats come, and then their kingdom did not last forever. Their kingdom also died with them. And then in Daniel 2.40, it says, finally, there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron. Somebody says strong as iron. If you, if you, if, if you watch, the, how many of us have watched Roman film before? The Roman movie. The Roman movies. If you, if you have watched them before, you find that most Roman movies, there's something spectacular about them. What do you see in them? Metals. You see metals in them. Metals. I mean, that's what you see. Most of the Roman thing. So the image of, and then it says, the image of gold, somebody said the image of gold, the silver and the brass, that my servants to represent the nations and their kings were successfully broken down by the iron monarchy of Rome. You see, Rome is divided, is, is standard as iron monarchy. Rome ruled with iron. You know, and God says, the kingdom of the Roman Empire will rule for a long time. They rule the legs of iron. That was, the, that was the same kingdom that Jesus was born. The Romans were ruling. It's the same kingdom that Jesus was crucified when the Romans were ruling. The same kingdom that, they, I mean, they, Jesus, they had to flee. Mary and Martha had to flee for their life when, when, this, when the Roman Empire were there. You know, Rome ruled in the area of the Atlantic. It, ruled, it was covering the whole world. They ruled from Rome. Even till today, find that Rome is still very, very important in the history of the world. So, what we are saying is that we have talked about four kingdoms. The, we, it talks about four kingdoms. The first kingdom is what? Babylonian kingdom. The second kingdom is what? Persia kingdom. The third kingdom is what? Is Greece. And the fourth kingdom is what? Is Rome. And in all this kingdom, they were ruling. Ruling the whole world, but it did not last. After some time, it was destroyed. Another kingdom came. After some time, another kingdom came. The last kingdom that ruled the whole earth was the Roman kingdom, the Roman Empire. Go to the embassy, go to, if, you go to, if you go to the internet, Google Roman Empire, you'll see it. They ruled the whole earth for several years. But something happened. Towards the end, something happened. Amen. Towards the end, something happened. The Bible says that Roman, that, that iron, legs of iron was suddenly divided into the feet the feet is a mixture of iron and clay. So I want to say iron and clay. Say iron and clay. 
The feet is a mixture of iron and clay. Praise the Lord. When, how many legs, I'm sorry, how many uh, toes do we have? Ten. On, ten. Yes. Five, five each, I mean. So Daniel saw that that thing had ten toes. When the Roman Empire was divided, it was divided into ten kingdoms. Somebody said ten kingdoms. It was divided into what? Ten kingdoms. But something was interesting about those ten kingdoms. It says it's a combination of iron mixed with what? Clay. When iron is mixed with clay, can they mix together? Can they be solidified together? So the Bible says this kingdom will be mixed, but they will never be able to become one anymore. Amen. In Daniel chapter 2 verse 41, it says, Just as you saw the feet and the toes were partly of clay and partly of iron. Verse 41, Daniel 2 41. So this will be a divided kingdom. Amen. It says they will never be united. So what the Bible is saying is that after the Roman Empire, there will not be a one world government anymore. Amen. It says when the Roman Empire was divided, suddenly it was divided into ten kingdoms. That is where we have the ten we have what we call divided European kingdoms that we have today. The ten kingdoms of Europe. You know, the ten divided European kingdoms. When it was divided, it was divided into ten. That's where you have all the Roman, all the, all the kingdoms that you have today in Europe. Like France, England, uh, Germany, you know, Sweden, Italy. All of them came out of that division of the Roman Empire. When the Roman Empire broke, it broke into ten. And God says... They will never, never be divided again. They will never, ever again be one anymore. You see, you find that after that, after that war and warfare, people began to gather together. They want to, they want to put Europe back as one, but it never happened. There was so much war at the beginning, but nobody could rule the whole Europe anymore. People tried in every way. But also they will never be able to come together. You know, they began to try different things. You know. They began to try different things to which we are they can see whether they can divide Europe. Freddy Castle of Denmark. I mean, they began to, what they did is that they built, each one built his own company, built his own country. He was ruling there. And then some of them tried to unite Europe, so whether they can have a one world government, but it never happened. And then when they couldn't do it, the Bible says they would try some things, which I want us to look at quickly now. They tried marriages. It says, I want to read that Daniel chapter 2. Please, everybody open your Bible to Daniel chapter 2. We are getting to the end of this, of this now so that we can understand it. It says, in verse 43, it says, We are as thou choice, iron mixed with merry clay. They shall mingle the seed themselves with seed of men, but they shall never cleave one to another. Not another, even as iron is never mixed with clay. Also, they shall mix the seed of men, but they will never be able to cling one to another. After some time, what happened is that in Europe, the seed of men, they will mingle together. When they saw they couldn't unite the whole Europe anymore, they started marrying each other. Say, so maybe we can marry, two, you can marry, if my daughter can marry that one, if I can marry this one, then I can unite. But they tried it. They put everything together, but nothing, nothing, nothing worked. They tried. And then somebody came, a man called Napoleon Bonifer came. Napoleon. Napoleon said, I will conquer the whole of Europe. Not will I only conquer the whole of Europe, I will rule the world. That was his dream. Napoleon says, in fact, they say, I was told that Napoleon has studied this prophecy that says after the Roman Empire, there will never be a one world government anymore. After the Roman Empire, says there will never be a one world government anymore. Napoleon has studied it and he said, I will defeat the Bible. I will make sure that it's a lie. I will conquer the whole Europe. And so Napoleon went forth. He began to fight, he began to fight. He was conquering, he was conquering. He conquered France, conquered Germany, conquered everywhere until Napoleon got to a place in England, you know, we had a call Waterloo. At Waterloo, the British army, they destroyed Napoleon. They defeated him and then he died at Waterloo. That's where Napoleon was turned back and Napoleon was defeated. God says after that Roman Empire, there will never be one world government anymore. God says, after the Roman Empire, there will never be one world government anymore. Napoleon tried, he failed. Several people have tried after Napoleon that they failed. I'm telling us, if I'm not only Napoleon, Europe was divided, you know. 
in, in, in the book of, in, in, one, in one book of called modern, on modern history, somebody was thought about Napoleon, says, what was the principal adversary of this tremendous power? By whom was it checked and resisted and put down? Because people said there was no power strong enough to put Napoleon down. No human power could pull him down. But the Bible, I mean, but that history, that historian said, by none and nothing but the direct manifestation, interposition of God. It says it was only the God, power of God that stopped Napoleon. And I'm telling you, nothing, can, nothing would have stopped him except God. Because God has said it, and so shall it be. Amen. Napoleon said, I will rule the world. I will do this. But God stopped him. The Bible says, Europe will be divided. It will never become, be able to come back together again. It says they will mingle the seed of men, but they will never, 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 never be able to become one. After that, several people tried to unite Europe. How many of us know somebody who wants to start another World War government? was Hitler. How many of us are out of, out of, out of Hitler before? Out of Hitler tried to rule the whole world. He conquered most of the cities in Europe. He conquered France. He conquered from Germany. He conquered um, Denmark. Conquered Sweden. He went on conquering and conquering all these places. But out of Hitler says he would rule the world. He planned to have a one world government. But he failed. And I'm saying to us tonight, everything that is against the word of God will fail in Jesus' name. Why is this prophecy so important? After that, they saw that nobody could rule the world. Europe will never be one anymore. So they now started what they call the United Nation. What did I say? United Nation. The, the goal of the United Nation was so that they can get all the countries to be one. One. Because they will mingle. Verse 43 says, they will mingle the seed of men, but they will never be able to do it. It says, they will mingle. It says, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall never cleave one to another. Even as iron is not mixed with clay. What I'm saying to us tonight, they started the United Nations, but we all know that the United Nations is never united. Nobody, I mean, they tried because God said there will never be one world government after the Roman Empire. It's almost, it's almost close to a thousand years now that the Roman Empire has been broken down into pieces. Still, there's no one world power, no one world superpower that will rule the world. I remember when we were in the university, when we were in the university and we were talking about. It was very strong. They call about Soviet Union, the Russia, I mean, communism, and, uh, and the Americans, you know. And I remember in university, some of our, members, some of our classmates would say, don't worry, very soon, because you are pro-communist, they says, we know, communism will rule the world. Communism will take over the whole world. They will destroy this, they will destroy that. But some of us that knew this prophecy will say, no. I tell them, I say, it's not possible. God has said there will never be what? One world government anymore. He says, no one world superpower will rule this world. No one world superpower will be able to control this world. That's what he said. He says, after them, they will not, nothing will happen. People tried, but they failed. People tried, but they failed. They tried, but they failed. Several, today, even Europe is still trying to unite. They want to have one, one currency. How many of us know that? They are trying to unite Europe. See if they can have, okay, one passport for Europe. But the Bible says it will not happen. They, they might try to make the single of men. But for us to have one united Europe, it can never happen anymore. One world government can never happen anymore. So it tells us that no superpower will control this whole world alone anymore. It will never happen. And that gives us peace. That God is the one that determines the affair of this world. Whatever he has said, that is what is going to happen. Let me close by this. Let's go to Daniel 2.34. It says, while you are watching, while they were struggling to rule for rulership, it says, hey, suddenly, it says, a stone was cut out without hands. A stone was cut out without hands. Suddenly a stone was thrown to that image, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Oh yes. And he said to them, that stone cut, broke them into what? Into pieces. He says, and the God, and what was he says? He says, and suddenly what happened? The stone that, he says, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. It shall break in pieces and consume all this kingdom and it shall stand forever. Amen. God is saying, listen, while they were watching, while men are struggling for supremacy, while men are struggling for power, says suddenly a stone without hand was thrown and it destroyed this kingdom. I'll read it to us. It says, verse 45. It says, for as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of mountain without hands, that is break in the pieces of the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God has made known to the kings what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, 
and interpretation is sure. Listen, so the dream is certain and interpretation is sure. What he's saying is that in the days of this European kingdom, which is where we are, in the days of this United Nation, where there is no unity, says one stone will come and set up a kingdom. And that kingdom is the kingdom of God. Amen. I want to say a superior kingdom is going to start. The kingdom of God is a superior kingdom. And I'm glad we belong to that kingdom. Amen. So that kingdom will come and destroy the whole of the sins. And the Bible says the iron, the, the grass, the silver, all of them blew away when that stone came. And I'm saying to us, that stone destroys them. And the, the good news I have for you tonight is that, you know, there has been speculation. Some people say, oh, maybe atomic bomb will destroy the world. Maybe some people, some American government, somebody one day will release one of, the, one of the bombs and the whole world will be destroyed. Human being has made enough bombs that could destroy this world 19 times to 20 times over. I say that, I repeat that again. Human beings have made enough bombs, the atomic bomb, the nuclear weapons have been made that will destroy the world at least 19, 20 times the size of this world. That's what they have on ground now. But the, so some people are afraid. Maybe one day there will be a mistake. But I've got good news for you. The Bible says this world is not going to be destroyed by human being. Amen. This world is not going to be destroyed by atomic bomb. It's not going to be destroyed by people or by bomb or by military force. No. That's, the Bible says, listen, in the days of this king, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. It says that stone will come. And that's coming, that stone coming is the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. When Jesus comes, you see, the king says, that, that stone came, that mighty stone, go. It says, kingdom, we, we, we destroy all other kingdom. It's a superior kingdom. And that's the kingdom that we belong to tonight. Amen. The kingdom of God is superior to every other kingdom. The kingdom of God is real. It's powerful. And it's going to take over the whole kingdom. In Revelation chapter 11 verse 15, it says, And there were loud voices saying, The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. And of his Christ. And he shall reign how many times? Forever and ever and ever. Let me say this to you as I close tonight. This world is coming to an end. And it's going to come to an end by the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is coming very soon. Whether we like it or not, Jesus will come. We are in the last phase. We are in that toe. Any moment from now, that stone is going to come. When that stone comes, that is the end of it. Hey, somebody say, what am I going to do? Jesus said in the book of John, chapter 14, verse 3. One to say, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also what? In me. In my father's house, there are what? Many mansions. If it were not so, I would have what? I would have told you. Say, I will go and prepare a place for you. Say, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be what? Also. Ladies and gentlemen, God, Jesus Christ is coming back soon. He's coming back to take us to where he is. Amen. That's why he's coming back. And he's going to establish a kingdom. I want to announce to you that that kingdom is superior to every other kingdom. Amen. And we belong to a superior kingdom. As I close tonight, I want to ask you a question. If you sleep at night, I usually ask that question. If you sleep in your house, tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, if you are sleeping at night and you suddenly heard there was fire, you saw smoke and you saw fire, what will you do? If you see smoke and fire, what will you do? Will you just get out? Will you, or what do you do? You go and what? And shout and call people, say, come, there's fire. There's fire on the mountain. Run, 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 run. Fire on the mountain. Run, run, run. Listen to me, church. This world is catching fire little by little. And there's a need for us to what? To tell the people. To tell the people. As I close, I never forget this story that happened in Chicago. I mean, it's, it's so powerful. It's a story that is pathetic. One of the tallest buildings in America caught fire at about the 17th floor. Of up, up, it caught fire. Or I think it was 10th floor up, caught fire. So as the building began to burn, everybody there was their fire alarm went, four, 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 four. There's fire, there's fire, there's fire. So everybody was rushing, rushing. And so there was this reporter in the building. This reporter was in the building. It was all on 11th or 12th floor. The fire was going up. So the reporter called his officer and said, hey, listen, church. He said, listen, listen. Oh, he called his boss. I'm in that building. I have a story that I can tell you. I'm right in, I'm right in the building that has caught fire. The, the boss said, are you crazy? He said, no. He said, get out now. The man said, don't worry. 
I want to report to you what it means. It's a good story. What it means to be in a building that is on fire. I'll be telling you minute by minute, statement by statement of exactly what's going to happen. So he began to tell them, the fire is on the 11th floor. He's now going to the 12th floor. He has moved to the 13th floor. He said, the, the man said, the, 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 the boss said, are you crazy? Get out before it's too late. He said, no, I've planned my escape. I know I'm going to get out. It's not, it doesn't matter. I will get out. So he began to explain to them, the fire has reached this level. It has reached that level. And they were writing. They were writing. They were writing. They were writing. The fire is there. And they were writing. Oh my goodness. And then finally, when the fire was about to reach almost the last step, he now says, hey, there's no way anyway. It's time to get out. I'm going to get out. So he ran to the place. There's a place called fire escape. He has thought he was going to go just slide in the fire escape and slide down. But suddenly, as he looked at the fire, the fire escape, he saw that the thing was red hot. That if he goes in there, he will burn alive. So he called the boy and says, I'm stuck. So he the, the fire man came and said, what are we going to do? Let's get him out. And so they said, how are we going to get this man out? They tried. Every I said, okay, just spread the net. So they spread the net and tell him, jump from this other 20-something floor. Just jump. So if he jump and he bounce on the net, he will not die. So the man says, he looked left, looked right, looked at the net. Oh, my goodness. And then he jumped, goes, because the house was going to collapse. Ladies and gentlemen, he missed the net. You won't miss the net in Jesus' name. You know why he missed the net? Because he waited for the last minute. Some people are waiting for the last minute. Tonight, I want to challenge us. Don't wait for the last minute before you jump. Because by the time you wait for the last minute, it was what? It will be too late. Let's rise up on our feet. Still without power, following the horrific tornado. Three twisters have touched down just south of town. And now, a rolling motion. I believe we're having an earthquake. I have never before seen such horrific weather. I advise you to take cover immediately. The books of Bible prophecy have long been shrouded in mystery. Ancient texts, cryptic numbers, symbolic imagery, all depicting awesome apocalyptic events soon to come. Is it really possible to understand what they mean? What is the mark of the beast? Is it, as some say, a computer chip implanted under the skin, or even something more insidious? And what about the Antichrist? Has this sinister enemy of God already made his appearance? Or is he still waiting in the shadows? Will some terrorist event trigger Earth's final tribulation? Will we witness the horrors of Armageddon and the seven last plagues? What do we need to know to avoid being left behind when the Lord returns? Will we recognize the last days and know what to expect? The books of Daniel and Revelation are full of numbers, figures, images, signs. Many Christians are silent about it. But is silence the solution? What do the numbers and figures such as 666 stand for? What is the mark of the beast? 
What is the role of the United Nations and America in prophecy? Are these prophecies still relevant to our age and time? Find answers to these questions and more in an adventure in Bible prophecy at Victory Sanctuary Seventh-day Adventist Church by Oba Oyekon Estate, Lekki, Fizwon, Lagos.